I'll Go Fetch Her Tomorrow, from Hidden Like Anne Frank, by Bloom Emden. Memoir. Background. Jewish children who went into hiding without their parents to escape being sent to Nazi concentration camps were known as hidden children. Most of these children stayed hidden for about two and a half years. In this selection, Bloom Emden, a former hidden child, describes her ordeal while in hiding. About the author. Bloom Emden, born 1926, is a Dutch Jewish woman who survived the Holocaust, the Nazis' mass murder of Jewish people in the European countries they conquered. When she was 16, Emden went into hiding. Emden has written several books about her experiences. As a child psychologist, she has organized group therapy sessions for other hidden children. I'll Go Fetch Her Tomorrow from Hidden Like Anne Frank by Bloom Emden After liberation, on my way back to the Netherlands, I sent a postcard to the house on Rheinstraat in Amsterdam that had been my safe house during the war. I wrote to say that I'd survived Auschwitz and was coming home. I got there a few weeks later. It was evening and Rheinstraat was bare, as all of the trees had been chopped down for firewood. As I climbed the steps of the Van Mops family house, I wondered what to expect. Freddy, my boyfriend, opened the door. I was bald and emaciated. He didn't recognize me until I spoke. Everything about you can change, but voices stay the same. He hugged me and called to his parents, Come see who's here. They welcomed me warmly, very warmly indeed. They'd been expecting me ever since they'd received my postcard. Freddy's father was based at Amsterdam's central train station as a Red Cross worker, and he'd scoured the platforms for me every day. His mother had sat waiting at the window. I have two dresses, she said. One of them's for you. Around four years earlier, as I was cycling near Rheinstraat, I suddenly realized just how serious the situation was. Hitler's words came booming out of large loudspeakers, which hung in the trees every couple of hundred yards. Wir werden die Juden ausrotten, ausrotten, ausrotten. We will eradicate the Jews, eradicate them, eradicate them. I made a decision. I am not going to allow myself to be eradicated. But I was also aware that it would be very hard to hide away from all that violence. Until then, I had been patient and let the war happen around me. I used to think, we're not allowed to walk down the street anymore? Fine, then we won't go for a walk. Then we won't go to the theater. Then we won't go to the library. Or out shopping. I saw all of their rules as harassment that we could live with. I only really became frightened when the deportation started and Jews were taken away and families torn apart. The first call-up started arriving in early July 1942, which is when we received ours. The orders were cunningly vague, stating the date and the place you were to report to, and that you should take clothing, a mug, and cutlery. I had turned 16 at the beginning of July, and like many of my classmates, I was part of the first group to be called up, Jews between the ages of 16 and 35. Most people obeyed the order. We're young and strong, they said. We know we'll have to work hard, but there's no way out, because we're registered and they know who we are. My father was so desperate that he went to visit the office that was responsible for the deportations. He said to the first German he saw, My daughter can't go. The man looked up at him in surprise but he took the call-up papers and put a stamp on them to say that I was exempted from deportation until further notice. This temporary exemption was called a spera. When the deportations first started, it was still possible to win over some of the Germans. That all changed later on. My parents also had a spera, so they would not be deported for the time being either. My father had once been a diamond cutter, and although he had had a different job for years, 
the Germans thought that people who knew about diamonds might be useful in the future. So I went back to school. It was a school that was just for Jewish children. Our classroom grew emptier and emptier as my fellow students were deported or went into hiding. At the beginning of May 1943, I did my final written examinations with two other classmates. By the time of the oral exam, a few weeks later, I was the only one left. But the twelve exams, spread over two days, went ahead as usual. At the end of the first morning, after the first four exams, Freddy was waiting for me at the school door. My mother had received a visit from some gentleman who had come to fetch me. Apparently my Spera had been withdrawn, so until further notice meant until today. They were going to come back for me at eight o'clock. They said that if I wasn't there, they would take my parents and my sister. As we were talking, the air raid siren went off. Everyone hurried inside. We went into the school. I had a flash of inspiration, and I went to the school principal. I explained what had happened and asked if he could arrange for me to take the remaining eight examinations that afternoon. The principal managed to get everyone together. I was the very last student in the school, and the only student in two classes, to take the complete set of leaving examinations. There was a brief meeting, and then they called me in and gave me my diploma. That afternoon, I didn't think seriously about going into hiding. It was a horrible thought that the gentleman might take my parents and my sister instead. Besides that, going into hiding was not something you could do at the drop of a hat. My mother had wanted to go into hiding, but my father was too scared, because if you got caught, you were automatically deported as a criminal. The Germans did everything they could to make people believe there was nothing to be scared of if you followed the rules. But if you broke them, then things could go very badly. We never thought their ultimate intention was to murder everyone, though. That was too awful to imagine. When I came out with my diploma, Freddy was waiting outside again. He took me to his parents' house, where we ate dinner. I got home a little before eight. At five past eight, the gentleman came. My parents were distraught when we said goodbye. My sister, Via, cried and waved after me through the window. Carrying my shoulder bag and a backpack, I followed the men to the police station, where I found other Jews waiting. We spent the night there, slumped on the floor, and trying to sleep. Shortly before I left, my mother suggested that I should try to join up with a family, as they might be able to protect me and give me advice. I soon met a suitable family at the police station. They had some younger children and agreed to adopt me as their eldest daughter. The next morning, the Germans took us to the Hollandsche Schauburg. It was a famous theater in Amsterdam, and until recently had been one of the few places where Jews were still allowed to perform and to attend shows. Now it was an assembly point where Jews from Amsterdam and the surrounding area were held while awaiting deportation. As people entered, their names and addresses were noted so that the Germans knew exactly which Jews they had in the theater. This also allowed them to make up lists of names and dates for transportations. They called it registration. I didn't want to be registered. If they didn't know I was inside, they wouldn't miss me if I managed to escape. As everyone lined up, I pushed my backpack forward a couple of feet. Then I walked back to fetch my shoulder bag and put it down a little in front of the backpack. I shuffled around and tried to make myself look busy. And that's how I got inside the Schauburg without being registered. The atmosphere in the building was awful. Everyone was anxiously wondering what was going to happen to them. I felt so lonely without my family, without my boyfriend. There were hardly any bathrooms in the building, and you had to wait endlessly in line for food. When I was in the Schauburg, I received a nice letter from my parents, with a number written in the margin, 339. It was the number of a house on Orteliastrat, where Truce and her husband Floor lived, acquaintances of my father's, who had offered several times to organize a place for us to hide. 
I knew that one of my cousin's friends worked at the Schauberg. Everyone called him Bull. It was days before I saw him. When I did, I stopped him and said, I want to get out of here. You and everyone else, he replied. But I'm not registered. Ah, that changes things. He said he'd see what he could do for me. A few days later, Bull came up to me and said, You're leaving tomorrow. At four in the afternoon, they'll ring the bell to tell the children up to the age of 14 to gather in the lobby, to be escorted across the street to the kindergarten. You can go with them. Just pretend you're one of the supervisors. Stay in the kindergarten for the night and get out of there the next day. I was so nervous the following day that I got clumsy and split the seam at the back of my shoe. There was a cobbler in the Schauberg who offered to repair the shoe for me. I gave it to him, and he said he'd bring it back in a couple of hours. But he didn't, and it was almost four. So I came up with the idea of asking my new family to send the shoe to the kindergarten. I told them what I was planning, but they strongly advised me not to try to escape. It was far too dangerous. When I told them that my mind was made up, they promised they'd do their best to help. The bell sounded and I hurried to the lobby. I was the first one there, because the children naturally wanted to stay with their parents for as long as possible. There I stood, with one shoe and one sock. Suddenly, the guard at the door turned around and shouted, Was machen Sie da? What are you up to? I froze. I couldn't say a word or move a muscle. The man looked at me, and his gaze moved down to my shoeless foot. Then he shrugged his shoulders and turned back to look at the street. The children came, and we crossed the street to the kindergarten, where I was to spend the night. It was far too risky to run away immediately. The Germans kept a really close eye on us. A few hours later, to my astonishment, a courier finally delivered my shoe to me at the kindergarten. Early the next morning, I went out on the street. The people at the kindergarten had explained to me that you couldn't just slip away. If you wanted to keep out of sight of the Germans across the street, you had to wait for the tram to pull up at the stop in front of the kindergarten. When the tram moved off, you walked along with it and quickly took the first right-hand turn. It worked. There I was, walking along the street, anxiously holding my purse in front of my star. It was a beautiful May morning, and the day soon became warmer. I was wearing a thick winter coat, which my mother had told me to take. But, on my way to Ortelia Strat, I got lost. When I arrived there a few hours later, there was no one home. I walked around the block and rang again. Still no one. I knew it was a really dangerous situation. If I was stopped, they'd send me straight back to the Schauberg. Then I remembered that I had relatives with a butcher shop on Kinkerstraat, not far from Ortelliestraat. As far as I knew, Uncle Carl and Aunt Martha hadn't been deported yet. They were exempt from deportation because they ran a Jude's Lokal, a store for Jews run by Jews. The shop was open. My aunt and uncle thought I was a ghost when I walked in, because they knew I'd been taken away. Somehow, they managed to reach my parents. They came over, and we spent some time together that afternoon on the floor above the butcher's shop. It was the last time I saw them. When I went to Ortelia Strat again at six that evening, Truce and Floor had returned from work. They were pleased to see me, and I felt very welcome. Floor went to my parents' house a few times to fetch things and my mother and father used the last of their money to buy a fake identity card for me. People from the resistance had inserted my photograph and a thumbprint onto the card, so now my name was Nancy Winifred Altman 